Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Power Company of Wyoming's Choke Cherry and Sierra Madre Wind Energy Project is one of the largest of its kind in North America. Plans call for up to 1,000 turbines to be constructed south of Sinclair and Rollins. The project will ensure a reliable, competitively priced supply of renewable energy that's unmatched in the West. We'll meet the company's CEO, Bill Miller, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. And it's our pleasure now to be joined on Wyoming Chronicle with Bill Miller. Bill, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Bill, you are the Senior um, Vice President of Energy and Land Resources for the Anschutz Corporation. Give us a history of the Anschutz Corporation and its history here in Wyoming before we talk about the massive wind power project that's being undertaken. Okay, Craig. Um, first, thank you for inviting us to participate in this program. Uh, the Anschutz Corporation has been actively involved in the state of Wyoming for about 75 years, um, primarily as a natural resource and agribusiness company. Um, it was here early in the oil and gas exploration and development um, in the Powder River Basin, um, even preceding Mr. Anschutz today, his father and um, his natural resource company, which ultimately became the Anschutz Corporation, uh, were active and uh, have remained active for about 75 years. And Bill, your background is in oil and gas. Yes, it is. Give us a, tell, tell me about that a little bit. Well, I'm in the industry, which you call an oil and gas landman. I have uh, been a practicing landman for over 40 years. I've been with the Anschutz Corporation for about 38 years and have run the natural resource business for Anschutz for a little over 25 years. Um, including the oil and gas company and uh, our agribusiness and our renewable energy transmission and pipeline businesses. Now, as part of your responsibilities, you're also president and CEO of Power Company of Wyoming. Yes. And that is who is creating this massive wind energy product project south of Rollins and south of Saratoga. Tell me the genesis for the program or for, for the thought of developing wind energy in that part of Wyoming. We're developing the wind energy project through Power Company of Wyoming, which is a wholly owned affiliate of the Anschutz Corporation. Um, it's being developed on a ranch that the corporation has owned for something over 25 years, or over 20 years anyway. The origination of the project came about probably 12 to 15 years ago. We've always been interested in the renewable energy industry and that business and that business model. And um, we acquired the ranch, which is called the Overland Trail Cattle Company, and subsequently determined that it has probably, if not the best, one of the best wind resources in the United States on the ranch. It sits right on the Continental Divide, and um, the performance of renewable energy projects in an environment such as this with strong Wyoming winds is unequaled. How, 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 how was that analyzed? How, how, did, how did you learn? I mean, we all understand, of course, that Wyoming's wind blows, but, but what does it mean to have such um, uh, great resources to, for wind power? Well, a little over 10 years ago, somewhere between 10 and 12 years ago, we recognized that this is a business that we wanted to be involved in, and we also recognized that uh, the location of the company's large ranch in Carbon County was an ideal setting for it. So we set about to do the analysis and hired a series of uh, consulting service companies to perform the analysis. And over the last 10 years, we've had, I believe it's 38 meteorological towers in place on the ranch, gathering data, monitoring the wind, and then we have a contracting company that works for us that does the modeling of that wind resource. And uh, it turned out to be actually better than what we would anticipate. Uh, just based on the NREL work that was originally done and which was the foundation for all the subsequent work. Um, it's turned out to be an extraordinary wind resource with capacity factors 
um, that exceed just about anything you're going to find, uh, certainly in the continental U.S. Uh, and certainly in the West. Many wind markets are, are wind farms. In my mind across the country, what happens in Iowa is an example for me, are closer to metropolitan areas. This one's farther away. So another part of your task, once the construction begins, is that this power has to go somewhere. Where, where is it going? Um, where will this power go? The market for this project and the market for this energy is going to be essentially the desert southwest. Uh, by that I mean the states of uh, California, Arizona, Nevada. Um, Wyoming has an abundance of conventional power. Um, it has obviously an abundance of wind power or the availability to develop wind power. And the market for a project such as this is going to be the states that have renewable portfolio standards and requirements. Uh, Wyoming does not have those renewable standards at this point. Correct. Wyoming doesn't have a renewable portfolio requirement for its um, service providers. Um, although Wyoming does get a significant amount of their electricity generated and delivered to the customer as a result of wind farms in Wyoming. Um, the incumbent utilities in Wyoming certainly have wind in their portfolio. But the wind that we'll generate from this facility will go to the desert southwest. Um, and to get it there, of course, as you realize, we're developing also as a, a parallel project, the TransWest Express transmission system. And you are also president and CEO of TransWest yes. Express. Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what, um, let's start with the wind farm first as far as where are we today? When will Wyomingites start to see wind turbines being constructed in that area? We are under construction. Um, we commenced construction in 2016 and uh, operated um, throughout the, the, the summer and the end of the fall of 2016 to uh, develop infrastructure for the project. This project requires a huge amount of infrastructure development because you, before you can ever uh, put up the first wind turbine. So we did that throughout 2016 and throughout 2017. Give me and, an example, Bill, of what that in infrastructure is for a wind farm. Well, just the, the first example for this project, simply because of the scope and scale and uh, um, the complexity of the development, is the primary access into the wind farm requires, I believe it's about 62 miles of road. And that's just to open the site up. Um, it's going to require a rail facility for delivery of turbine components and other materials. Um, it requires that 62 miles of road. It requires the opening of an on-site quarry for material supply, for road building, turbine construction, all those things. So that's really been the focus for the last two working seasons is to develop that primary infrastructure. We're not done yet. There's a lot of mile of road to build. Uh, Last year, we started developing individual arterial roads and turbine sites um, for the construction of individual turbines. Um, there's about a thousand turbines. That number is going to fluctuate slightly depending on, uh, you know, final constructability of some of the project. But um, there are 700 and some miles of arterial roads in addition to the 62 miles of primary road that have to be constructed just to access the turbine sites. There is um, some thought that um, this will be a phased project, <clears throat> that, that, that it will be phased over several years. What is your timeline, Bill, for, for this entire project to be implemented? Well, it is a phased project. Um, you can't just go out and build a thousand mm -hmm. turbines and have the market absorb it um, all in one piece. Um, the project will be built out over a number of years. We don't have a final determination or a final timeline, uh, but the project will be built in phases. It was permitted in phases. Uh, both the wind farm and the transmission system will be developed and brought online in phases. Uh, for simplicity's sake, let's say that it's two phases. Each phase will be 500 turbines, uh, but within each phase of 500 turbines, there's also phasing over multiple years. Um, because of supply of material equipment, turbines, and also for the market to absorb 
the project, you um, need to phase it. There's been, you touched on it just briefly, but significant regulatory permitting that has happened over the last 10 years for this project. First, give us a, a history of that. And then are there still regulatory hurdles that you still have to um, get over, so to speak, um, in order to completely uh, uh, be through that process? <clears throat> With regard to the history of the permitting and entitlement process, uh, it's taken 10 years. And for the two projects combined, we have spent well in excess of $100 million. Just in permitting. Just in permitting. Now, I say just in permitting. There is a significant amount of design, engineering, and stuff like that that goes into that. But you have to do it to get the permit. Mm -hmm. You have to know what you're going to build. So it's taken 10 years. We have in hand uh, final environmental impact statements and final environmental analysis for both projects. Um, we're proceeding with construction on phase one of the generation project. Um, but it's taken 10 years to secure all those permits and multiple federal, state, and local entities, um, agencies, regulatory agencies have been involved in that. Still more to, still more to overcome? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Not anything that is of the scale of what we have had to do in the past, but we are doing the wind farm as an example under an environmental impact statement that was done and approved by the Department of Interior. Um, to comply f with the environmental impact statement and the record of decision, we incrementally have to do additional work, uh, site-specific work, cultural, um, uh, biological, stuff like that. But those don't require an environmental impact statement. They require environmental analysis, which is done under an environmental analysis type document. Mm -hmm. So um, that's an ongoing process. Uh, our monitoring of uh, birds of prey, our monitoring of uh, uh, things like the greater sage grouse, uh, that's an ongoing program in which we work cooperatively with Wyoming Game and Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and of course the Department of Interior, um, mm -hmm. all the entities there. Some of the thoughts that you've read about, about wind power um, that might be, if you were to list pros and cons, pros certainly renewable, <clears throat> long-term, efficient cons, you touched on it. Um, um, bird kill, um, sound. Are there some myths associated with um, <clears throat> what maybe some things people may not understand about those projects relative to um, those uh, types of issues that you hear about from time to time? I don't know that I would call them myths. There's certainly a lot of misinformation. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's deal with the birds as an example. Um, our eagle permit, um, um, we have a conservation plan and eagle permit um, that allows us the take of a certain number of birds. But to compensate for that, we have a mitigation program where we're doing mitigation um, power pole retrofits and things like that. The concept with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, an example, is no net loss. And we have committed the project. Actually, over the years that we worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we redesigned this project five times to mitigate uh, the, uh, for example, an eagle take or something like that. Uh, we repositioned the turbines. We redesigned it. We created corridors within the project for uh, fly pass for birds. Um, we don't have a huge impact or a huge population of birds of prey that we have to deal with, but we have enough that we have to deal with it. And um, we have gone to great lengths, quite frankly, to uh, mitigate any impacts to uh, the birds, uh, whether they be songbirds or whether they be birds of prey. And uh, we're quite pleased with the outcome. We're very pleased with the results we have with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on our, uh, our conservation plan and uh, the, the program that will allow us to go forward with this thing requires all that mitigation and we've got it all worked out. We're pleased with it. Ranching will continue on the, on the ranch. Oh, absolutely. After yeah. all these turbines are even installed. Yeah. Um, when it <clears throat> comes to the ranching operation, this really has no material impact on it. Uh, the biggest impact is the guys that work on the ranch really like all the new roads. Yeah. 
there is going to be a tremendous economic benefit to not only Wyoming, but specifically, specifically to Carbon County. What's your analysis showed of what that impact will be? Well, the overall impact to Wyoming, and this is all the project, um, the generation project as well as the transmission project, um, the impact to Wyoming is going to be a billion dollars in new tax revenue over the life of this project, and it's very much front-end loaded. Uh, property tax is obviously uh, somewhat front-end loaded, but it extends over the entire life of the project. Sales and use tax is the real big number um, in that billion dollars, and sales and use tax will be paid as the project is constructed. So that's going to be front-end loaded within the first say five years of the life of the project is when those taxes will be paid. Uh, the state of Wyoming, the counties, municipalities in those areas all will receive a, a, a big revenue source from these projects. And I think I should point out to our viewers that you've worked very closely with local and county governments in Carbon County. Oh yes. Uh, Carbon County Commission, uh, we've worked hand in hand with those folks from the day we came up with the concept and started the project. Uh, we have um, had a great relationship with Carbon County. Uh, we've got a good relationship with the towns, uh, Saratoga, uh, very much so. Rollins, they've been great. Uh, we've worked um, with Wyoming Industrial Siding Authority uh, for our permit with them and um, provided mitigation for a lot of the things that we will be doing as far as workforce housing and stuff like that. So now we've got a great relationship with Carbon County and the, and the communities in Carbon County. I'm sure like with every project, there are some people that have concerns. What concerns have you heard? Um, start first with maybe from some folks in Carbon County. Well, any commercial activity is gonna have um, a downside or drawbacks. Uh, they'll be different in the view of different people. Um, the issues we've dealt with in Carbon County are workforce housing. Uh, people have had reservations about how we'll impact the community as a result of that. They have had reservations about uh, um, viewshed, which I think we have adequately addressed. That was part of the five redesigns of the project. Uh, Much of this will literally be out of the public view as I understand the project. The vast majority of it. Uh, uh, you have to understand the ranch is 500 square miles and the entire project is located within the boundaries of the ranch. There will be a viewshed impact to some degree that you'll be able to see from Interstate 80, for example, as you go between Sinclair and Rollins. Uh, you'll be able to see some turbines on the far hillsides. Uh, there's no doubt that there will be a viewshed impact. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, that's both a positive and a negative. A lot of people like them, uh, but there's a fair share of the people that are in those communities that don't like them. Uh, but the closest turbine, I think, to uh, either a home or the view shed, for example, from Interstate 80 is like three miles away. So it's not like it's in your face. I'm sure you've driven I-80 and looked at the developments around Arlington and Elk Mountain. It won't look anything like that. It's gonna be much further away. Or even in uh, southwestern Wyoming, in between Lyman and Evanston, for example. Correct. <clears throat> Very close to the, to the road. Bill, Wyoming has a wind tax. Yes. One of the few states, one of two states, as I understand it, that does. Has that impacted this project in its either in its conception or its scope? Well, when we conceived of the project, Wyoming didn't have a wind tax. Um, in fact, Wyoming had a tax holiday, for example, on the sales and use tax. And in the early years of the project, uh, those taxes uh, well, they sunset the uh, uh, exemption for sales and use tax, so that came back into effect. Um, and then as a result of that, in that succeeding legislature, and this is, I'm gonna say eight or nine years ago, uh, the legislature passed a generation tax of a dollar a megawatt hour. And it's not the only one in the United States. For a long time, we thought it was. It's not, there's a, one of the states in the upper Midwest has a generation tax. But when they put that on, they offset it by um, tax credits in other areas and their tax structure within that state. So Wyoming does have a dollar a megawatt hour wind tax. It obviously had a material impact on the project, on the project economics. Uh, we looked at it at the time. I opposed it at the time. Opposed the tax? Oh, certainly. Sure. Yeah. Uh, 
because we had just um, been put in a position where the sales and use tax came back into effect. But that was going to expire anyway, so we probably would not have made the window where the sales and use tax was waived within the state of Wyoming. So we just kind of moved on from that. Um, we had a lot of discussion about the dollar megawatt hour. We uh, folded it into the economic analysis, and we do an economic analysis on this project practically weekly, <laughs> just, just mm -hmm. to make sure because of markets and the vagaries of what's going on out there. Um, the dollar megawatt hour uh, is a tax that we were able to absorb into the overall economics of the project, and we looked at it, didn't like it, that's fine. There are a lot of taxes I don't like, whether personally or for the corporation's point of view. But it worked, and it still worked. So we just moved on. Governor, also, our, the Yendal um, group, of which you're a part of, yeah. briefly touched on um, wind energy, among other things, and included this in their report, um, support of efforts to, among other things, support renewable and wind energy development. What can or what should that mean to projects like yours? Certainty. If we had certainty on the regulatory climate and the tax climate and the things that um, are in the control of the, the governor's office, uh, the local communities, the councils, the permitting agencies, and the Wyoming legislature, the most important thing to us today is certainty. If we knew for a fact that the federal rules weren't going to change, that the state rules weren't going to change, that the tax um, rules were not going to change, um, that's the most valuable thing to me today, is to know that I can go forward with the project without having to worry about whether or not they're going to change the rules. So where are you at in that certainty scale? I'm feeling pretty good about it right now uh, with the um, federal permits in hand. Uh, there are things about them. There are things about the royalty structure on the federal lands that I don't particularly like that we're working with um, the congressional delegation from Wyoming and other states to address. Um, but right now I feel pretty good. I think we have as much certainty, certainly more certainty today than we did for the last eight years. Governor Mead also quoted recently about the project. I want to read you his quote and then ask for your response. He said, we're getting ready to build um, we're getting ready to build the largest wind farm in the country. And he asked, how many components are being made in Wyoming? How many people working on that are from Wyoming? How much of the intellectual property came from Wyoming? Whatever those answers are, we need to do better, he said. What's that mean to you? I, I don't know that it means a lot to me. Uh, yeah, Wyoming probably could do better. Uh, Wyoming certainly should make every effort to attract the manufacturing, maintenance, warehousing facilities that are going to be associated with wind development in Wyoming. Have they made those efforts to this point in your mind? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. uh, they have talked about it quite a bit. Uh, the Infrastructure Authority had made a concerted effort to attract some of those functions. Uh, even prior to Governor Meade's administration, uh, they had attracted and uh, I, I think secured an opportunity for a company to build towers in Wyoming. Uh, but as a result of the wind tax and the market for Wyoming wind, uh, no new wind other than one small project uh, by Casper has been built in Wyoming in eight years. Uh, Wyoming's uh, share of the renewable energy market that could have been developed as part of Wyoming's portfolio uh, just has not happened. Moving forward, um, do you believe that um, you'll be able to, I assume you do, be able to attract the construction workers that you need? Um, will they come from Wyoming? Will they come from other states? Where will they be trained? Where are they being trained today? The construction workers for the project, uh, the work that we're doing so far has been done by Wyoming contractors. Uh, it uh, has attracted and employed a lot of Wyoming people. For example, over both the last two years, we've had somewhere between 60 and 80 people on site working on this. Our contractors from Casper, um, for both of those construction years, they employed Wyoming people um, out of the local union shops, both in Casper and uh, 
Southwest Wyoming. We have not imported any that I know of as far as outside of Wyoming construction workers. Construction workers are somewhat of a migrant group anyway. So uh, I don't know where they all come from, but uh, we have a Wyoming preference, uh, not only in our um, Wyoming Industrial Thide Industrial Siting Authority permit, but in our corporate culture. If we're going to be working in Wyoming, we're going to use Wyoming people. That's kind of the way we do business. And once the project's constructed, what is your guesstimate on workforce requirements? Workforce requirement for the projects when both the transmission line and the wind farm are done are going to be about 150 people. Right now, I think we have an estimate in our uh, permitting documents of 114 or 116 people directly employed on the wind farm. Uh, that'll be for operation of the wind farm when it's fully built out. The additional people, and it's going to be somewhere around 30 uh, total, will be support services and the transmission line. Now, you have to understand we're building a $500 million substation at this end of that transmission line. That requires a lot of maintenance, a lot of operation people. Uh, there will be a significant amount of warehousing when you have a thousand turbines turning. Uh, you got to have a parts warehouse close by. Uh, so there's going to be a significant number of employees uh, involved in support services. Like Ancillary that. to the direct yeah. project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But directly employed on the project will be somewhere between 140 and 150 people. As we conclude our discussion, Bill, you said a few years ago, <clears throat> about five years ago, that this is the right project for the right time in the right place. You still feel that way today? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I think the it's always been the right place. Um, now that we have gotten this far with the development of the project, we certainly think it's the right project. And over the last 10 years, there have been a couple, three right times. Um, I think the timing is right now because of uh, the appetite for renewable energy in the West um, and the appetite for opportunity for big um, infrastructure projects such as this. I, th I absolutely think it's the right project, right place, and right time. Well, Bill Miller, President and CEO of Power Company of Wyoming and TransWest Express, it's been an absolute pleasure to visit with you today on Wyoming Chronicle and best wishes. Thank you. Thank you.